Uh, today we're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. But uh, before I do that, I, I, wanna, I, wanna hi- I just want to acknowledge that today's message is going to be quite simple. I have a simple message today. And my goal is that we could all take a step forward together no matter what that looks like. I, um, I have a Peloton bike that I ride for exercise. Uh, and, and on the Peloton, there's this exercise that you do. I think most cyclers, cyclists do this, but it's called the VO2 max. And it's a brutal 20 minute, like give it everything that you've got, push it to the, push it to the limit to see what your oxygen, your, how much oxygen can your body handle and what kind of output can you put onto your bike in that amount of time. And it's trying to estimate your, your fitness and your strength. Now, this VO2 max, why it's beneficial is because when you do a certain kind of training, uh, what they do is they'll, they'll have, they, they, they've got a chart of one through seven, and you need to compete on your own chart. And so you can have people from all fitness levels, from all layers of VO2 max, doing the same exercise, getting the same amount of work, even though one person is much more fit than another person. And I, and I see it happen on the leaderboard because you know, I'm giving it everything I've got. I want to fall off the bike. I wanna, I'm borderline on death, and I'm, I'm in pain, and I'm looking, and there are people who are doubling my score. But it's the same workout. It's the instructor giving the same instruction, and they're, they're, they're judging the workout based on output. And, and so as much as today's message is going to be simple, and I'm not going to really introduce anything new to you today, I want to invite you to look at the scale of your life and see where is the invitation from the Spirit of God for me to grow today. Where's the invitation from the Holy Spirit to take my next step? So whether you are brand new to the things of God or you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years, there's something for you today. Amen. Can you go ahead and stand your feet with me for the reading of Scripture? Let's read this together. His divine power has given everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from past sins. This is God's word to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us today. Not so that we could have a moment, but so that we could be transformed into your likeness together and that every single one of us could have the privilege and the pleasure of hearing you speak to our hearts and minds and usher us into new life in you. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen. 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 Go ahead and grab a seat. Just so I can get a sense of what we're working with. um, I, I, I had a wedding on Friday night and they did one of those wedding dance things where they, you know, they have people stand up and sit down for how long they've been married. But instead of standing, if I, I just like to start with everybody's hand in the air. Everybody's hand in the air. Everybody do it. Everybody's hand in the air. Now, if you have been walking with Jesus for less than one year, or maybe you haven't even ever surrendered your life to Jesus before, and you're like, man, I didn't even want to be here today, uh, go ahead and put your hand down. Okay, so there are a few of you. If you've been walking with Jesus for less than five years, Go ahead and put your hands down. If you have been walking with Jesus for less than, or for, for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, come on, we got some vets in the house, 25 years with Jesus, 30 years with Jesus, 35 years with Jesus, 40 years with Jesus, 45 years with Jesus, 50 years with Jesus, come on, somebody. 55 years, 60 years with Jesus. Let's rejoice. Come on. We got some faith in this house. Oh, I should, did I, should I have kept going? Are we, how, how many years have you been walking with Jesus?
79 years with the Lord. Y'all, y'all got some room to grow in this place. And this is exciting for me. You've got a really cool mix of people who are just beginning their walk with Jesus. Now, you have a bell curve in this room of just starting off, been with Jesus for quite a long time, and then been with Jesus for a very long time. And, and, but all of us together this morning have an opportunity to take our next steps together. Amen. One of my guilty pleasures is those, those videos on, on YouTube where people celebrate too early. You ever seen one of those? Guy runs back 99 yards and then drops the, the football right at the end line because he wants to start celebrating too early. And so he gets all the credit for running 99 yards, but not the six points that he was running for. Or you see somebody showboating in a race towards the end of the race and the next person passes them. Or, or they're, running, they're running a race that just happened during the Olympic, the, the Olympic trials. I, I, it wasn't in the United States, but somebody heard everybody cheering and the cheering was getting louder and louder. And the person's like, I am amazing. And it, it, people were cheering because the next person was passing them. Now, it, it's, it's funny because it's awful. And it's amusing because it's not me. But it's tragic if we consider that sometimes we live our Christian lives this way. Pastor Duke and I have talked recently about a book called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. And in that book, he highlights that over 50% of the population still considers themselves to be a Christian, which is great news. 50% of people, if we got serious about following Jesus, we we could change the world. Jesus did it with 12 disciples. But less than 5% of the population would identify as being an apprentice or a disciple of Jesus. And what I, what I draw from that is that tragically, 90% of the people who are calling themselves Christian are celebrating too early. We're celebrating, have run 99 yards, and we drop the ball on the one-yard line. And we don't enter all the way in to what God has for us. So whether you're new to a relationship with Jesus, you're 75 years into a relationship with Jesus, the invitation is hold the ball all the way. Let's finish this race and finish it strong. And what Peter is doing here is Peter is saying, come on, now now add to your faith these things. It's cool that you got faith. If you have faith in Christ, congratulations. If you feel faith rising up in your soul and you're considering this thing in Jesus, congratulations. You're in a great place to have your life be transformed, but you're not done yet. Don't say, don't say I'm done. Don't say I'm finished just because you enjoy the benefits of salvation because there's more to the Christian life than just salvation. There's transformation. And there's an invitation to join God in his great mission of making all things new. And and many of us fall short of that, just satisfied to come to church on a Sunday morning and sing songs and get goosebumps and hear Pastor Eddie and hear great preaching and great worship and be a part of a great community, but not enter into the things that those things are supposed to invite us deeper into. Now, Peter has this list of things that he invites us into, and, and I read the a New Living Translation, but, but in, the, in the ESV, it, it, it has different words. It has, uh, make every effort to supplement faith with virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection with love. And it's a call to grow in these things. Today, I'm not going to talk about how, um, these things in particular. What I would like to invite you to do is go study those on your own. What I would like you to do this week is to go study them on your own. What I want to do is I want to talk about the kind of way that God invites us into growing in those things so that you can get those. Are you tracking? And in this way, I've got nothing new. I'm using your Encounter Christ Experience community, Extend the Kingdom, to outline the things that God has for us. But before we get there, I want to make a couple observations about this text. Second Peter is, is, has, has the apostle Peter looking at his execution, and these are his farewell words as he prepares to be executed. If you've ever had the opportunity to speak to somebody who's at end of life, there's remarkable clarity as the, their life is concentrated down into a few ideas. And Peter, as he awaits his, his, his death, 
He's reflecting on what it is and what matters the most and what is it that God has for us in this life of following Jesus, having left everything to follow Jesus and seen him crucified, buried, and risen from the dead, having experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and in the transformation of thousands of lives. Peter's now reflecting on his life, and he says, I know this. I know this, that everything that you need for life and godliness is supplied to you through Jesus. He has it all for you. Now, I know you hear that, and you go, but I need some other things too. But those other things mean far less if they're not first built on the foundation of knowing Jesus. Now, Peter says that it's not on the basis of your wealth. It's not on the basis of your attendance or your participation. It's not on the basis of your service. It's not on the basis of your job or your performance or your title. It's not on the basis of any of these things that God gives these things to us. It's on the basis of his goodness. It's on the basis of, of his loving kindness. It says that it says who called us by his glory and his excellence. And this is good news for every single one of us because otherwise we'd be disqualified. If it was on the basis of our strength, Mark Petty would be doing real well right now, I would not be doing so well. If it was on the basis of wealth, then millionaires would have the inside track on godliness, but that's not what it is. If it was on service, then the Hesses would have a head start on some of us. When I met the Hesses, they came, they came to Sterling because they wanted a place to meet. All right, I mean, a place to serve. I remember in one of our very first conversations, it was like, hey, so what brought you to Sterling? He said, I'm looking for somewhere to serve. It was the first and maybe only time I've heard that sentence by somebody who didn't want to preach from the front. Because sometimes preachers, you know, it's like they mean serve, they mean preach. Sometimes it means I want the microphone. He said, I wanted to come and serve. So if it was on the basis of a willingness to serve, then the Hesses would have a head start on the rest of us. But it's not on the basis of that. It's on the basis of the glory and excellence of Jesus that he invites us into a life of godliness. Y'all, that's really great news. This means that when you're tired, you're not disqualified. This means that if you've sinned, you're not disqualified because his glory and excellence isn't sacrificed by your laziness or your sinfulness or your rebellion or your willingness. Oh, this is really good news. So we're invited into this. And he says, add to your faith, add these things. And, and, and he invites us into this new life so that the spirit of Christ could enable us to grow in all of these ways and all of these things and be participants in his divine nature. So what is the knowledge of Christ? Now, the knowledge of Christ that, that brings about holiness and, 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 and uh, godliness in the life of a believer is the, is the intimate knowledge of who he is, how he is, and what he does. It's an intimate knowledge of the Savior of the world, the creator of the universe, the lover of your soul, where you can be with him and be transformed by him and be seen by him, where you're no longer hiding yourself from him. Anybody, anybody come into church and you're like, I'm laying it all open except for this. Except for that relationship, except for that bill. Except for this longing, except for this hope, except for this fear, except for this dread, except for this joy. I'm, I'm coming and I'm bringing most of myself to God. We'll never know him fully until we reveal ourselves completely. There's a time coming, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, where, where we will see him face to face. But for now we see him dimly as in a mirror. But the opportunity to know him more, more face to face is experienced through our vulnerability, our intimacy, through our transparency to him. And so there's this knowing of God. The knowledge of God is not just memorization. It's not just organization or awareness. It's not even the proximity to the things of God, but it's a nearness to the person of God. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But God gives us these opportunities to grow in these things as we encounter Christ, as we experience community, and as we extend the kingdom with one another. So how do we how do we how do these things help us take hold of these virtues that Peter is inviting us into? I'm so glad you asked. There was a reveal study done. They call it the reveal study in the, in the mid-2000s. It was, it was a commissioned study that looked at the lives of 40,000 believers. 
and they were trying to figure out what makes for a spiritually healthy, a spiritually vibrant Christian life. And here's what they found. They found that these things do not correlate to being spiritually healthy. The size of the church, the number of ministries in the church, the education level of the individual, the style of worship, the style of preaching, or association with great leaders. These are not the things that make for a spiritually healthy individual. Now, it can certainly get you in the direction and put you in the right place for it, but this is, that's not it. Because these are things that everybody else does. That's actually a connection I just made, so I'm getting some revelation right here with you. <laughs> what is it? It's found through reading your Bible, having a prayer life, building your own relationships, giving and serving. Because it's real easy in a church that's well organized and as robust as Grace Covenant Church to just wait for them to put on the small group, to wait for them to host the moment. Isn't it? Isn't it tempting? Because you're busy. Your life is full. You got, you got kids camps and all these activities and school and your own job and your own desires. We, we all want to get that nice. We, some of us just want to make it to the couch and not get back up for like three days. You're faking those COVID tests, trying to hide. I know it. I think it's COVID. I'll just, I'll just quarantine. I don't think you have to quarantine. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure I need to. I just got a personal conviction. Self-quarantine myself. But as it turns out, building your own relationships leads to life, not waiting for the church to do it for you. There's so much more here, but we're gonna, that's what we're going to spend our time unpacking. I believe that these, what, what's great about a good church, what's great about a great church, is not just the worship experience, not just the pulpit, not just the people who are present, which all of those things are a celebration. I think that what makes for a great church is that they create the right environment for you to experience these things on the right. And that's what Grace Covenant has done. And I want to show you where to find it so that we can all take our next step together. Amen. Now, here's the thing about the VO2 max test is that it's real easy. Like the the the... the your grade will change. There was, a, there was a time last fall where I was running a lot, and my VO2 max score dropped, even though my mile time was increasing. So my cycling was getting worse as my running was getting better. And then as my running got worse, my cycling got better. And then I tried swimming with my, my daughters who were on swim team, and I almost died, and I gave that up. <laughs> swimming is dumb. It's a... It's a it's a sport of staying alive. They should just call it staying alive, Pastor Eddie. It's like, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like, hey, just put your face in the water and try and live across the pool. Right? Like, like, it was just a terrible experience. I, and, and they're so much faster than me. But here's the thing. Sometimes what we can do when we've been walking with Jesus for a little while is we go, oh, no, no, I'm good. Because you used to have a devotional time. Back, back in college, you had that devotional time. When you just got saved, yeah, that was 30 years ago now. It's time to re-up. Well, what you might find is that, that you, you think that you've got a prayer life, but if you actually time log that thing, you realize, oh, no, I'm only talking to Jesus at mealtimes and bedtimes. That's not the vibrant prayer life that we're invited into. Are you tracking? So what I want you to do, and, and, and not by way of heaping, the, I, I hope you feel in my disposition and, the, and by the Spirit of God in this room, that by, by inviting the Holy Spirit to highlight the areas where he wants us to, ch- where he wants to challenge us and invite us to grow, it's, it's not a spirit of condemnation, but a spirit of conviction that says, come on, there's life change waiting for you if you just step in. Are you tracking? So, so I'm, I'm proud of you. Whatever you're doing well, maybe it would do your soul well. Maybe you need to do it for yourself. But just write down and be like, I'm doing a great job of X. And maybe I need to grow in Y. Right? And just acknowledge where you, like if you're here on a Sunday morning, you're doing great. Check that out. Like I came on Sunday morning. Even if this is the first time you come in forever or the only time you've ever come, 
You got that on your list. I put myself with and among the people of God. Step one. Now, step two is getting that coffee date, getting into community, building relationship, and living with someone else. Okay, so let's, let's break down these, these things on the right. I'm breaking them down in, in, in the three categories of encountering Christ, experiencing community, extending the kingdom, so that we can gain access to these virtues that Peter is calling us to. Are you tracking? So encountering Christ, three of the seven traits that Peter listed are found in another really important list in Galatians 5.22. We see that self-control, goodness, and love aren't actually virtues that you can create in and of, in and of yourself. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It means that if you want these things in your life, if you want to add to your faith, self-control, goodness, and love, you got to go to the throne of grace because you can't manufacture this on your own. And that's real good news. Anybody tried to manufacture love? It lasts until they don't love you back. (laughs) After what I did for you, You know, it's like, it's like false service. It's like, I, I am guilty. 20 years into marriage, I am guilty of serving my wife so that she would serve me. And the only reason I knew I, that was happening is because when she didn't serve me back, I was like, hold up, this is broken. I don't want to serve you anymore because I don't feel served back. We got to get something from, from Jesus in order, in order to give it. And the three ways that I'm going to highlight out of that list of spiritually healthy people is that, is that we get that through, we encounter Christ by reading the Bible through prayer, and I'm going to put giving here. Now, I could put giving in any one of these three places, and I'll tell you why it's here. Now, we, when we read the Bible, what we're doing is not just going for memorization and information. We're going for inspiration. We're going to be taught. We're going to learn. We're going to be transformed. And when we read the Bible, there is a temptation in today's world to examine the scriptures to see if they agree with us or to see if we think it's right. Can I get an amen? Anybody in the last five years been reading the Bible? Be like, ah, no, I don't think that's right. I don't know if we can trust the translations. One of the things your pastor did has helped me the most in is in reading the Bible. He gave me a hunger for going after and studying the Bible to figure out what it means, not just so that I could have it up here, but so that it could drop into here and bring about transformation. But when we read the Bible, we're not just examining the Bible. We're asking the Bible to examine us. What we're trying to do is not just study the word, but to be with the living word, the, 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 the logos. Now, now, the Greeks had this idea, the logos. You've heard that phrase, logos? You've heard that? We, y'all, y'all got a lot of church in you. So, so you've heard logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was God, and the logos was, 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 what was with God, right? So like, so like logos. Now, now, the Greeks had this idea about logos, that there was a framing idea from which everything came. That was the logos. So there was this logos. There was this idea from which everything came, by which everything was held together, and to which everything was going. And John, when he wrote his gospel, said, hey, Greeks, in the beginning was the logos, this idea that contained everything and from which everything came, by which everything is held together, and to which everything is going. And as you read the Gospel of John through the first chapter, verse 19 through 21, you realize that the Logos is Jesus himself. And when we read the Word, what we're doing is we're approaching the Logos. And it's better than an idea. He's a person. It's better than a thought. It's a person who's inviting us into relationship. So it's not just about spending time with ideas. It's about spending time with a person who wants to transform your life. And, he, and where you're falling apart, he'll hold you together. Where you need a new beginning, he was at the beginning, and, and he can restart everything. And where you need to know whether or not it'll come to a pleasant or a redemptive end, he's standing there at the end as well. And when we read Scripture, we're stepping into the presence of 
of the Logos. And we're spending time with the Logos so that he can transform our hearts and minds and bring us in line with him and his kingdom and his purposes for us forever and ever. Amen. Now, here's what happens is you begin to realize that eternal life isn't just about what happens after we die. What happens is as you spend time with Jesus, you realize that eternal life in Scripture is actually talking about fullness of life, which is available to us now, not just then. It means that salvation isn't just for later, but it's for today. It means that, it means that we can have a living and vibrant relationship with the living God and those around us because the Spirit of God is living with us and in us and through us. Oh, this is good news. So we spend time with God through uh, through time in the Word, through, through, uh, through the Bible, and then also in prayer. And when we talk about prayer, it's not just meal times, but I'm talking about relating to God through life and opening up that conversation with the Spirit of God and talking to Him about the things that trouble you. Now, I'll tell you this. I, I heard one time that if you have to tell more than three people about a problem, you don't actually want a solution. What you want is attention. That hurt me. I was so rude. It's like, I'm a pastor. I'll tell you when I need attention. What I realized is that sometimes what I'd rather do is tell everybody else about what's happening instead of going to the one who can solve it. Because I know sometimes the Spirit of God himself is going to point me right back into that situation, but to, he's going to point me back in to be a changed man in that circumstance. And I'm not interested in that. I just want somebody to make me feel better about it. So when we think about prayer, I'm not just talking about taking him your meals. I'm not talking about giving thanks only. What I'm talking about is talking to him about the things that are troubling your heart. So, so just kind of set a cue for your soul that if I've told more than three people about this problem, it's time to go to Jesus. It's actually probably too late to go to Jesus. Not too late. You can go anytime. Like, <laughs> like not too late. I mean, I'm just, I'm just late catching up. Right? I, I'm slow. I'm slow. I learned to read slow. I learned... I learned most of my lessons after I failed the test. Anybody else that way? I'm just kind of slow with it. I, I learn after the test. And, and normally not, not by doing well in the test. And then I look back and I'm like, oh. Like looking at game film, being like, nah, I messed that one up. Next time I'll get it. So we're invited into this life of prayer where we have fellowship with God in prayer. Where we, where we spend time sharing our heart with him, but we also sit quietly enough to hear his heart for us. Some of us just need to turn off the radio. Some of us need to enact a, a, a Netflix off time on your calendar and deal, with the, like, and deal with the dread of silence. Anybody else terrified to turn off the TV a little, just an hour earlier so that you could sit uncomfortably? with the people in your house. <laughs> but even better than that, maybe approach the throne of grace. Say, Jesus, I want to make room for you today. Will you meet me? And here's what I know about my Savior, is if you take that little tiny step in the direction of his presence, he'll affirm the promise that he made by stepping up on that cross. He'll meet you. He'll meet you. Taking too much time on this, but giving money. Now, I put it here. It could be community because community gives together. It could be money. We could, could put money in the extending the kingdom because money helps accomplish that. But here's what I've realized recently. I think that the giving of our money is maybe the single greatest test of the faith of a believer. Somehow, we are more willing to trust God with our salvation and our eternity than we are with our dollars. That's uncomfortable. We're like, I believe that you'll save me from my sin You'll save me from the grave, and you'll allow me the privilege of living in your presence forever and ever and ever, and you'll invite me to rule with you in glory. But I don't trust that you're going to reward me for giving. 
that's real quiet. I, I hope you're having the same moment I had when I realized that just this week. The single greatest test of our faith is likely our money because it's the last thing that we're ready to give him. Like if this was a message, like if we did a, a money message, it'd be like, hey, you're willing to go back to your spouse and apologize, right? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, I want a reasonable life. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I can do that. It's like, great. You, you ready to love on your kids even when they're irrational and it's crazy in your house and they're just losing their minds and they're demon terrorists climbing the walls and eating your stuff and breaking your stuff and burning your money and you know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 I'll love them, definitely, definitely. I can trust God for their salvation, for their grace, for their upbringing. Could you trust God for your boss? Yeah, maybe now we're... But could you trust God? What else? But could you trust God to supply your needs even as you give? It's funny, isn't it? What a lie from the enemy. But if we're going to be a spiritually healthy, vibrant, and alive people, we need to surrender even that to Jesus. Okay, let's keep going. Experience community. This is where we're going to experience the building of organic relationships. This is where Grace Covenant has done an extraordinary job of creating opportunities for you to fellowship, but it's your responsibility to build the relationship. Okay? That's the difference between the spiritually aware person and the spiritually healthy person is the building of these relationships. Now, now I'm talking about Christ-centered relationships. You know, sometimes it's easier to build relationships with people who are outside of the church or, or you know, like, because we're afraid, but we need to overcome these barriers. I'm, I'm talking about the godly relationships where you would, can, where Jesus would sit at the center of it, where, where the Spirit of God could be present, where you can be transparent and honest about the invulnerable, about the things that trouble you, and, and go to people for, for faith and direction and guidance and perspective. Now, I listened to a podcast earlier this week uh, that said that people are actually now entering into romantic relationships with AI bots. Because these AI bots will do what they, they'll do what you tell them to do. And so when you tell the AI bot, you're like, I just need to be affirmed. It will just only affirm you. I'm sorry you feel that way, David. Tell me more about how that feels. I love you. They've got AI bots saying, I love you. Speaking words of affirmation and using emotional vocabulary without any actual empathy. And the ethicists are looking at this and going, we think this is a problem. And they can't quite figure out why. But they can all agree that the, the, the great trouble is that it will lack... The, the friction necessary for growth. Where's long, come on, friction. <laughs> iron does sharpen iron, but don't we hate that? You know, a bit of heat. Oh, my Lord Jesus, we need that friction. So, so hey, there was this, so anybody have a hermit crab when they were growing up? How long did it look like? Three days, right? So, like, hermit crabs, <laughs> they can live for a really long time. But, it, but, it, but they were really expensive because they couldn't figure out how to breed them in captivity. They couldn't breed them in captivity. And so, so they, they had to import them. They had to, they had to catch them in the wild and then bring them in. And what they, you know, what they found after studying these hermit crabs is that when in a breeding facility, what they did is they make it clean so that the hermit crabs can be healthy. And they make it clean so that they, they wouldn't get infections and so that they could, they could breed the healthiest version of hermit crabs so everybody could have hermit crabs and it'd be free for everybody and it would be wonderful. The only problem is that they needed the 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 chaos of the waves crashing and the dirt in the and the sand up in the up in the water they needed the mess of the dead fish and the smells and the salt and the, they needed the chaos in order to thrive and there's something true also about the human spirit that needs the friction that comes from living in community even with those people who trouble you so that you can survive and thrive and become the person that God has created you to be and yet it's the primary reason that we run away 
The primary reason we run away is because of the people, and it's the primary gift that God has given you to grow into the fullness of God's plan and purpose for your life. It is here. It is this proving ground of the virtue that Peter is talking about. It's here that the, 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 the proving ground of self-control and the, and the proving grounds of, of, of godliness, and the proving grounds of his divine nature working itself out in you of virtue and self-control and steadfastness. Now, now, if you, now you could think that you're steadfast when you're by yourself. But then you get put with some people and you realize, oh, I'm not so steadfast after all. I'm doing real well with just me and Jesus. But the thing about these three E's is they all point you back to the other two. Because you can't spend much time encountering Christ before he sends you to some people. And you can't spend some time with some people without being sent back to Christ. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> One of the greatest rebukes I ever got in my life was from your pastor. He rebuked, he rebuked me lovingly, kindly, gently. But he brought to surface uh, some waywardness in my, in my soul, a way that I, I had I deceived I was doing good things, too. It was like I was trying to do a really good thing, so I just didn't tell the whole story. And Pastor Eddie's like, nah, fam, you got to tell the whole story. There's something going on in your soul. What's up? That water churning to reveal something in my soul so that I wouldn't be satisfied to continue living that way, especially in ministry especially when I'm trying to do good things. You tracking? Experience and community. The AI stuff won't cut it. Now, I know, I know, like, we all kind of like, hey, that's crazy. But the reality is our soul longs for something. And everything about our world tells us that other people aren't safe. And, and what I love about this people, what I love about Grace Covenant, is the safe environment that you've created for people to be able to come in weakness and to be built up, to grow strong, to fellowship deeply, not just in strength, but in weakness as well. I would encourage you as you pursue this relationship there, uh, just at the sake of just beating a drum that I know you've heard before, look for different kinds of relationship in it. I think sometimes what we do is we just go look for our peers, and we're like, where's my friend? Where's, where's, where's my friend? And then we're like, oh, I don't like this place. I can't find my friend here. But God's got more for you than the people in the same demographic as you. And some of the people who have had the greatest, actually most of the people who have had the absolute greatest impact in my life are 20 or more years older than me, and I love to chase them down. When I come back to, to Virginia, I meet first with the old heads. Some of them spanked me growing up. That, that kind of relationship. I snuck in and out of town a couple of weeks ago for something that was taking place, and I met with Pastor Duke. I'm not telling you to meet with Pastor Duke. He's trying to retire. You just can't get rid of me. You got to do it for free now. <laughs> Last night, I met with two of the retired elders of Grace Covenant Church. And I talked to them about how they created in me an appetite for the word and a longing for the spirit of God. They offered me something that my angsty peers <laughs> couldn't offer me. As, as we were going through little kids together, and they would just laugh. I love calling my mentors and being like, hey, things are wild here in, in Denver, and I'm fighting with my wife, and I'm confused about my kids, and I don't know what to do. And, and one of my mentors, this is so funny, every time, every time I call, he just laughs out loud. He's just like, young man, tell me about it. Just what's going on? And it's like, we both know how this, we know how the phone call is going to go. Every phone call is the same phone call. I'm having a problem. Ha, ha, ha. Tell me what's happening. And then I go, well, it's, it's crazy. And he goes, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? What do you, you think? What do you think, David? I said, I don't know, man. I just, that's why I'm calling you. And he goes, climb back up on the cross. It's worth it. 
And for the rest of your life, keep climbing back on the cross. And then he'll tell me, like, you know, me and my wife, we just had to fight ourselves. He goes, guess where I went? Right up on the cross. Picking on my cross every single day. So look for those mentors. Look for those peers. Find them. Find them. But the peers might, might surprise you. It might surprise you who you find to be a peer. And also look for relationships where you can sow into someone else. Um, you know, Chrissy Hessen in her testimony this morning highlighted the beauty and the benefit of service is that it drives us back to the throne of grace where we have to learn again who Jesus is and what he's doing. Don't just serve to check the box on Sunday morning. Serve because it's going to drive you into the presence of God so that you can take your next steps in becoming more like him by testing and practicing and, and accessing and accumulating these virtues that Peter is inviting you to. And finally, extending the kingdom. This is where we find the service. I mean, Chrissy said it so well. I thought, oh, look at that on the slide I put giving down there. I really should have just put it in all three places. Family, there's something about service. Somewhere along the line, we were sold a false bill of goods that being a Christian means going to church on Sunday morning and then isolating the, the rest of the week instead of being a force of good that reveals the kingdom of heaven everywhere that we go. You have, as believers, the opportunity for the Spirit of God to strengthen you in your work. You don't have to just do accounting, but you can account for the glory of God. You don't have to just build. You can build for the glory of God and delight in the presence of God even as you do accounting and as you build. Wherever it is that you find yourself working, God can come alongside you empower your work and reveal his kingdom in and through your work and your relationships. As we serve, not just here on Sunday morning, but also in our cities, can you imagine the change that would take place if this kind of transformation were to take root in this, in this house through your life? We all want the church to be more than it is, but it's going to have to start with you. Because the things on that left column, if you go back to the things that don't produce these things and the things that do produce these things, is nobody can, these are the things that Pastor Eddie and the leadership of Grace Covenant Church are concerned with, creating those environments. But these are the things that the Spirit of God is calling you to as you take advantage of the environment that has been created for you to grow. And some of that environment is chaotic. You can go ahead and you come out of play. Some of that environment is chaos, not even by design. It's just chaos because God designed it. You know, there's nothing like getting in into a church and getting behind the, you get behind the curtain a little bit and you're like, oh, it's a little chaotic. Yeah, it is. And maybe it's because God wants to test you. Maybe it's because God wants you to get healthy. Maybe it's because God wants you to get healthy so that you can make it healthy. Right? Now, I'll tell you, as a, as a pastor, sometimes sometimes there are things where I'm like, it, it, I look at it, I'm like, I don't know, we're just going to, it's just going to have to be a problem. <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to solve that one. We'll just see what happens. We'll just trust Jesus in this thing. <laughs> sometimes I do my best and I create an even more chaotic environment than when I let something go. But I have to believe that there's something in this for all of us because it's, it's, not, it's not Pastor Eddie's job or my job or, or any pastor's job to make it easy for everyone. That, that would be impossible. We would never be satisfied and the pastors would be dead. Because what's easy for one person is not for another. Right? You, you, you can't do that. You can't do that. Family, there's the opportunity for the kingdom of heaven to explode out of this place. 
as we serve, as we give, as we build our own relations, take responsibility for our own relationships, as we fellowship with God in prayer and spend time with the living God by studying his word and allowing him to examine our lives through his word and invite us into something far better than we could ever create for ourselves. Do you have your thing? Did you feel your VO2? Do you feel like, you know, it's lactic acid builds up in your legs when you're on a bike. And it's just like, you just want to fall off the bike. It's just the worst feeling in the world. But, but that's what conviction can kind of feel like. You're like, oh, okay, I see. I haven't been in my word. I have no prayer life. I ain't got any really. I've been waiting for them to build my relationships. I haven't given a thing. Or maybe I, I have given, but I haven't given. And I gave like I trust a little bit. Anyway, do you have a thing? If you got a thing, can you stand to your feet? I want to pray. You don't have to stand if you don't have a thing. It's fine. There's not like a, there's no pressure. There's like no judgment. I'm going back to Denver and I don't know you anyway. So even if I did judge you, it's worthless. So whatever that thing is, wherever you feel the spirit of God inviting you to grow, now, now, many of us, we overlook godliness right, like right off the top. Like the whole point in the knowledge of Christ is to produce godliness in us so that we can become like him. The big picture is that as we do these things, we, we fellowship with Christ. And as we fellowship with Christ, we become like Christ. And that's how we become godly. That's, that's the whole thing. And so if you've got any godliness to grow in, but you don't even have to stand to do that. Just, just pray with me, whatever it is. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your loving kindness towards me, your faithfulness and your mercy that pursues me so faithfully. Now, God, I ask that you would create in me a pursuit for you, a pursuit for your presence, a pursuit for your purposes, pursuit for your goodness revealed to me in relationships and through service. Spirit of God, we repent this morning for the places and the ways that we've had a bad attitude about you and your kingdom, where we fussed about your bride, where we've waited for someone else to do it for us while we waited for somebody else to preach the right message or, or hit that right note. God, this morning, we all surrender afresh to you and ask that you would have your way in us as you transform us into your likeness according to your loving kindness. I want to give you just a minute to pray in your own words. What is it that you were wanting God to do what is it you're asking him to do? I don't need you to make, I don't need you to make a commit. Like, don't be like, God, if I, I'll do this. Don't, don't make promises. What, I'm, what I want you to do is tell God where you're vulnerable. Tell him where it hurts. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you need. God, you know our need greater than we do. You know where we want to grow more than we do. Now, God, I ask that you would allow us the great privilege that comes with freedom of falling into your grace, being empowered by your spirit, and being transformed into your likeness. Spirit of the living God, I ask that you would empower us to take the steps that you put in our heart. That you would empower us to spend time with you, to pursue these relationships, and to serve for your glory. In Jesus' name.